وعلى أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي So last week we finished this uh, tafsir of uh, Surah Al-Balad and inshallah today what we're going to do is we're going to take a short break from the tafsir and as we've done a few times before after finishing a surah, we basically went through the life of one of the Mufassirun of the past. So inshallah, today we're going to do something uh, similar as well. And we're going to be going through uh, the life of one of the famous Mufassirun, not as famous as uh, others which we may have heard of, like Ibn Kathir and Imam Al-Tabari and so on and so forth, and Imam Al-Qurtubi and others. Uh, but if one reads the books of Tafsir, especially Tafsir ibn Kathir and Tabari and other books, which are from the older books, uh, you'll find his name coming up quite frequently. And this is uh, the famous Mufassir from the Tabi'een by the name of Mujahid ibn Jabbar. So if you read the books of Tafsir, uh, Tafsir ibn Kathir and other books, you'll see his name. Mujahid said regarding this ayah such and such along with some other famous names as well. So inshallah, we're going to be going through the life uh, of uh, this tabi'i. But before we go into the life of this, uh, this famous Mufassir Mujahid, uh, rahimahullah, uh, I want to talk uh, first of all about how tafsir basically evolved through time, just so we can understand the context of when uh, Mujahid, rahimahullah, was around, because he's from the tabi'in and he studied from the companions, as we will mention, inshallah. So, after the death of the Messenger of Allah والسلام, there were some companions who were considered to be from the Mufassirun, from the interpreters of the Qur'an, from the scholars of, of the Qur'an. And from them were of course the four Khalifas, Abu Bakr and Umar, Uthman Ali radiallahu anhum ajma'in. And then you had other companions who were considered to be scholars of Islam and also scholars of the Qur'an. And from them were uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Ubayy ibn Ka'ab, uh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, Zayd ibn Thabit, Zayd ibn Thabit, the one who uh, was the one who was responsible for compiling the Qur'an during the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He was also one of the scholars uh, of the Qur'an from the companions and uh, he, he was also the first scribe of the Qur'an, the first one to record the, the Qur'an when it was revealed to the Messenger of Allah Zayd ibn Thabit. Also uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair and others as well, Anas ibn Malik and other uh, scholars of the Quran from the companions uh, anhum ajma'in. So these were the companions who were known to be uh, scholars of uh, the Quran in and of itself. And after the death of the Messenger of Allah والسلام, and in fact even before he passed away when the Muslims were conquering lands the companions and the Muslims they never stayed in Medina. So they would travel and they would go to other places to live. So we know for example Mu'ad ibn Jabal went to Yemen to to, call, to give them da'wah and to call them to Islam. And other companions as well, they went to different places across the Muslim world to uh, educate people, to teach people, and some went to live elsewhere without any specific uh, intention of giving, giving da'wah, but just to live in a place other than uh, Medina. So, and because the Muslim lands expanded, so they wanted to uh, go to different places. So, so because of this, you had companions who had traveled to different places for whatever reason it may be. And of course, one of those reasons was to give da'wah, was to call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, during the time of the companions, when we talk about tafsir, there was no complete tafsir of the Quran specifically in and of itself. There was no tafsir of every single ayah. But there were tafsir of specific ayat. Ayat which maybe were vague. Ayat which maybe people had difficulty understanding. You know, those ayat which, because you have to understand this is the time of the companions. And so the, they, they generally understood ayat except for those which maybe were difficult to understand or there were words in them which were hard for a person to understand what the meaning of, the, of, of them was. So those ayat which, which were vague or which people had difficulty understanding, those were the ayat which the companions would basically give the tafsir of. Uh, as time went on, as time went on, the tafsir of ayat basically increased, meaning more and more uh, ayat were explained and more and more uh, tafasir of ayat uh, were given. Why was this the case? Because Islam spread. And so you had people who were accepting Islam, you had people who were becoming Muslim, lands were being conquered, and the people of those lands, they weren't Arabs. 
And what happens when you have people who aren't natives of the language of the Quran? They start to misinterpret, misunderstand the ayat of the Quran, misunderstand what the meaning of those words are from the Quran. And so as a result of this, as time went on and as uh, time passed after the death of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the tafsir of the ayat became increased more and more in terms of you know, how much was basically explained and how much uh, was recorded. Also the scholars, uh, they talked about the levels of the mufassirun. So the first level, as Imam Suyuti rahimahullah says, the first level of the mufassirun were the companions. Okay, so they were the, you know, whenever we talk about tafsir of, of surahs or tafsir of, of, of Quran or tafsir of certain ayat, we basically look first of all at the explanation of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then when we look at the Mufassirun, we look at the companions, what the companions said about specific ayat. And then after them, we look at the Tabi'een. So, so Imam Suyut, rahimahullah, he says the first level is the level of the companions. The second level is the level of the Tabi'een. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, tafsir, there was a more of a need for tafsir later on because you know time was passing by after the death of the Messenger of Allah والسلام, lands were being conquered and knowledge in and of itself is gradually decreasing which is the Sunnah of Allah Azza wa Jal, you know as time goes on up till until the day of judgment up till today and, into, and, and until the day of judgment so uh, Imam Suyuti he mentions these levels the first level being the level of the companions the second level being the level of uh, the Tabi'een and as a result of the companions traveling to different places, okay, with the intention of calling people to Islam, certain schools became prominent. And we don't mean actual physical schools, but prominent companions who were scholars in their own right, because they traveled to a certain, certain part of the world, certain part of the Muslim world, people who basically traveled to them to study and to learn. And so they became schools. Just like you have schools of thought, the Madhaib, for example, Imam Ahmad. There wasn't specifically a school, but it's the, 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 the thoughts of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, and other, other, other scholars. So likewise, at this time, there were certain schools. And, and with regards to tafsir, there were three main schools, okay, with regards to uh, the companions in the science of tafsir at this time. So this is after the death of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And those main schools were the school of Mecca. So you had one in Mecca, you had the school of Medina, and you had the school of Kufa, which was uh, in Iraq. So these were the main schools with regards to the tafsir of the Quran. And Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he talks about the schools uh, of tafsir and, this, and, and these three schools. And he says that the most knowledgeable of these schools in tafsir was the school of Mecca. It was the school of Mecca because they uh, were the companions or the tabi'een who studied under Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Abbas basically he lived in Mecca he moved to Mecca and he settled in Mecca because of course he's the son of who is he the son of Al-Abbas who's Al-Abbas the uncle of the messenger of Allah وسلم. and where they're from originally they're from Mecca the Quraysh Okay, so he was from Mecca, Abdullah ibn Abbas went, to Mecca, went back to Mecca and he settled in Mecca and he would teach the people uh, tafsir amongst uh, other sciences and uh, narrations of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and so on and so forth. From his students was Mujahid ibn Jabr, rahimahullah, the one we're going to be talking about today. Also from his students was another famous scholar of, of the Quran, of tafsir, Ikrima. Ikrima, Mawla ibn Abbas. Ikrima, the slave of ibn Abbas. And he's a, again, he's a name which comes up a lot in books of tafsir. Also, Saeed ibn Jubair. And there are other uh, tabi'in who are from the students of Abdullah ibn Abbas in the city of Mecca. And uh, we, when we talk about ibn Abbas, he was one of the, as we mentioned, one of the senior uh, scholars of tafsir amongst the companions. The messenger of Allah, والسلام, he made dua for ibn Abbas. The famous dua, and he said, Allahumma... Uh, oh Allah, give him understanding of the religion and give him, uh, teach him the interpretation of the Quran and also give him hikmah as, as is mentioned in, 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 in another narration. So from based on this, uh, from this, from this dua, okay, uh, in this hadith which we've mentioned, the messenger of Allah والسلام, made dua for Ibn Abbas which of course became true because 
the dua and the supplication of the messenger of Allah وسلم, be, you know, comes true whenever he supplicates for something. And so Ibn Abbas became a scholar of Islam, he became a faqih, he had understanding of the religion, and he was also a scholar of uh, the Quran and an interpreter and a mufassir of the Quran itself. And as I mentioned, the most famous mufassirun in Mecca from the students of Ibn Abbas, so after his demise, after he passed away, from the most famous were uh, Mujahid ibn Jabr, Rahimahullah, Sa'id ibn Jubair, uh, Ikrima, and also someone by the name of uh, Tawus. So these were the main uh, scholars of tafsir uh, who were residing in Mecca. Uh, Mujahid ibn Jabr, his name was Mujahid ibn Jabr, al makki al qurashi al makhzumi So he was from the city of Mecca, and his kunya was Abu Hajjaj. And some say his kunya was Abu Muhammad. And his family were a family of slaves. So, you know, uh, from before, uh, they were basically uh, slaves of an individual which we'll talk about uh, in, in, a, in a short while, inshallah. And uh, this, this uh, tabi'i, Mujahid, rahimahullah, he was born in the 21st year of the hijrah. And this was during the leadership of Umar radiallahu an. So this was basically uh, when he was born. And as I mentioned, his family was a family of slaves. And it's said that Mujahid initially, in the early stages of his life, he was the slave of an individual by the name of As-Sa'ib ibn Abi Sa'ib. As-Sa'ib, the son of Abu Sa'ib. And uh, they say that he was the son of Abdullah ibn Sa'ib. And Abdullah ibn Sa'ib was a companion of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu uh, It said that the Messenger of Allah alayhi uh, knew him before prophethood. So before he became a prophet, he knew Abdullah ibn Sa'ib, who was the father of the, the individual who had a slave who was Mujahid. So this person, Abdullah ibn Sa'ib, uh, this companion, radiallahu uh, an, knew the messenger of Allah وسلم, before prophethood. And they would trade and they would do dealings with one another. After the conquest, he never became Muslim until after the conquest, when the messenger of Allah وسلم, saw him and he praised him. He praised Abdullah ibn Sa'ib and he became Muslim. It said that uh, Mujahid uh, ibn Jabr, uh, rahimahullah, was the slave of either the father Abdullah ibn Sa'ib, or he was a slave of the son, as Sa'ib ibn Abi Sa'ib. And uh, the scholars, they say, historians, and those who have written about Mujahid, uh, rahimahullah, they said most likely, uh, because the other scholars, they mentioned that he was a slave of other people. So they mentioned a few names. Some mention uh, Ibn Sa'ib, some mention uh, the, the, the father, some mention the son, and some mention other people. But they say most likely it was uh, as Sa'ib, the, uh, the son of Abdullah Ibn Sa'ib. And they say because Mujahid himself, he mentions a story. And he says that uh, I used to guide as Sa'ib because he was blind. So he says whenever... Uh, Abdullah, uh, whenever as Sa'ib, the Abdullah ibn Sa'ib, the son, as Sa'ib ibn Abi Sa'ib, whenever he would want to go somewhere, I would basically be his guide because he was blind, he couldn't see. So he needed someone to guide him. And sometimes he would ask me, has the sun started to descend? Meaning, has the sun started to, to come down? So once, it's, once it reaches its highest point, okay, after, at the time of Zawal, okay, the highest point, part just before Dhuhr, as soon as it starts to descend, that's when the time for Dhuhr comes in. And so he would ask Mujahid, he would say, has, the, time, has the, the sun started to descend? And so Mujahid, he said that if I would say yes, then he would, he would pray Dhuhr. Meaning he would pray as soon as the time came in, which is uh, you know, the best time for a person to pray. So this shows us that he was basically the slave of uh, As-Saib ibn Usaib. Uh, also, we don't know much about, as I mentioned, about his family, who his father was, who his grandfather was, other extended family members, even close family, uh, most likely because, as I said, they were a family of slaves. And of course, generally in society, the slaves aren't given as much uh, notice or recognition except through their actions, especially when it comes to Muslims. So even though Mujahid was a slave himself, you know, with regards to his conduct and his righteousness and his knowledge, you know, Allah raises people based on their knowledge and he lowers people based on their, on their ignorance and on their, on their sin. So we don't know much about uh, his family and his ascendants except the fact that they migrated to Mecca previously and they settled there and they were uh, basically uh, slaves. Uh, also, we don't know where exactly they came from. 
or even from which kind of direction. So we don't know exactly where they came from, from Yemen or from other parts of, of Arabia. We're not sure exactly where they, came, where they came from. And, you know, one of the lessons we can learn from this is that in society, sometimes you may see people, you may recognize people, and you don't know much about them. And you may not say much about them or think much of them. Okay? But later on, as time goes by, that person will gain recognition because of certain deeds that he did. You know, sometimes, because we mentioned here, we don't know who he, who he, who he was, who his family was, where they came from. Yet Mujahid is still mentioned in books of Tafsir. And we'll mention other things, virtues about Mujahid as well. And so this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the fact that a person can do good deeds, okay, as a result of those good deeds, he won't be given recognition while he's alive. But he may be given recognition many, many years later, after he passes away. And a, and a good example today is Muhammad Ayyub, rahimahullah. You know, subhanAllah, it seems as if, you know, after his, after his demise, after his death, he's more popular than he was when he was alive. It seems like people talk more about him and listen to his recitation more uh, now that he's passed away as opposed to when he was alive, the, the famous imam of uh, the Prophet's Masjid, who just passed away uh, a week or two ago. So again, this shows us the fact that a person, he may be recognized in the sight of Allah or in the sight of the people through the in the will of Allah Azza wa Jal, many years after he passes away. And this is a sign of the good that he does. And again, with Mujahid, this is the same thing. It's, it's the case with Mujahid as well. Uh, as I mentioned, we don't know much about his background, we know his family, where they came from. Also, we don't know much about his youth. So there's not that much information about his youth, uh, you know, how his upbringing was. Uh, even his habits and his practices from a young age, these types of things, we don't really have much information or any information actually. We don't have any information about uh, anything to do with his childhood or his, or his youth. Uh, but what's mentioned uh, from the things which are narrated is that Mujahid rahimahullah, he participated in the conquest of Constantinia, Constantinople. So he was one of those uh, people who was part of the army which participated in the conquest of Constantinople. And that was led by an individual by the name of Maslama ibn Abdul Malik. So he was from that army which basically participated in the conquest of uh, Constantinia, in the conquest of uh, Constantinople. Also, uh, it said that, and it's narrated that he traveled to Kufa, and Kufa being the other school. Okay, where people would travel and they would go in pursuit of knowledge. He traveled to Kufa and he stayed there for a period of time. But he actually returned back to Mecca as well. So again, this shows us that he was someone who traveled. He was someone who participated in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in wars and conquests of the Muslims. And also he participated, most likely it seems like he participated with regards to traveling in search of knowledge, in, in search of knowledge and pursuit of knowledge. And this obviously uh, brings about a barakah and blessing with regards to the, to the acts and the deeds that he does himself. You know, when a person makes effort and tries with regards to seeking knowledge, then there's more barakah and blessing in the knowledge that he seeks. That's why sometimes if you sit at home and you're watching videos on YouTube nonstop, okay, you don't uh, make as much effort, the barakah isn't as much. I know the famous hadith of those who gather in masajid and in, certain, in uh, gatherings where the book of Allah is recited, there's so many, barakah, so many, things, so many blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal. Angels descend upon them. Allah mentions them to those who are with him. Tranquility surround, envelops them. So there's barakah in gatherings of knowledge, more so than a person watching uh, you know, online and so on and so forth. And again, we see this from the time of the, you know, of the scholars of the past, the tabi'een, the companions, and even the other scholars, the salaf of the past. They would travel in search of knowledge. And you know, today we would think that because of knowledge being so easily obtainable, so easily accessible, that we would all be of a higher level of, of knowledge, a higher level of ilm, a higher level of righteousness. But it's actually the opposite. The opposite is true. Even though knowledge is so easily accessible today as opposed to the past, you know, people are still, people are in fact more ignorant than before. You know, and this is due to the fact that there's less barakah, less blessing. Also, intentions are different. 
you know, people's intentions are different, and you know, righteousness isn't as prevalent as it was before. So this shows us the fact that when a person travels, when he makes the effort to learn, the more effort he makes, the more barakah and blessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give that individual with regards to his knowledge and when he teaches it to others. Also, another interesting story with regards to Mujahid ibn Jabbar, uh, rahimahullah, is a story about uh, Al-Hajjaj. Al-Hajjaj, as we know, was the governor of uh, Iraq and he was known for his ruthlessness and he killed uh, companions uh, as well uh, at that time. And Al-Hajjaj, at one point uh, during that time, he was the governor of Iraq and he ordered uh, an individual by the name of Abdul Rahman ibn Ash'ath, who was one of the, uh, the leaders and commanders of an army. And so this person, Abdul Rahman ibn Ash'ath, he ordered him to send an army, he told him to lead an army and make his way towards a certain land, okay, somewhere in the Tur Turkic area, uh, around Turkey, to go and basically uh, fight an army that was there. Uh, while Al-Ash'ath was making his way there, he basically revolted against Al-Hajjaj. He revolted and he disobeyed Al-Hajjaj's Al Al orders, who was the governor who had sent him to, to, to conquer that part, that part of, uh, of, of, of Turkey. So when Al-Ash'ath basically revolted, uh, some of the people who are from the army, okay, because the army now basically scattered into different places, they went their own way. You know, some went, you know, one place and uh, some went uh, uh, another place. They all went to different places. From those people who were in the army was Mujahid, Mujahid ibn Jabbar. And also from those people who were in the army uh, were Ata. So you had Mujahid ibn Jabbar, you had uh, Ata, and you had other uh, uh, tabi'in, famous tabi'in as well. These individuals, the scholars, these scholars who are from the army, because obviously in those days, the scholars also would participate okay, in, in, in battles. They would participate and join the army as well. So Mujahid and uh, Ata uh, and also uh, Saeed ibn Jubair. Saeed ibn Jubair, Ata and Mujahid and some others, they basically went to Mecca. They went to Mecca and they settled in Mecca, who, uh, which at the time was under the governorship of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the famous Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So they basically went to Mecca and uh, they settled in Mecca uh, after someone else was appointed as the governor of Mecca. So this is basically now after Umar ibn Abdul Aziz has, uh, has gone. Okay? He's not the governor of Mecca anymore. Somebody else is now the governor of Mecca. Uh, Hajjaj orders that individual to basically find those who left the army and settled in Mecca. Because obviously he hears news and finds out that people went to different places. So he says find those people who basically went to uh, Mecca. So he sends people uh, to look for these specific individuals and they find Mujahid and they find Saeed ibn Jubayr and uh, they find uh, others as well uh, and they basically take them to uh, Iraq. They, they, they're basically taking them back to Iraq to see uh, Al-Hajjaj and al along the way some of them passed away while they were on the way back to uh, Iraq. Saeed Ibn Jubair, who is also a famous scholar in his own right, and he's known as Sayyid al-Tabi'in, the leader of the Tabi'in, Sayyid ibn Jubair. Maybe one day we'll talk about Sayyid ibn Jubair as well. Sayyid ibn Jubair, uh, rahimahullah, he was executed by al-Hajjaj. Okay, so he was executed by al-Hajjaj, and there were others who were released. Uh, for example, Ata, uh, I think Ata and uh, some others, they were basically released. Mujahid, the... The, the man we're discussing today, the scholar who we're discussing in the tabi we're talking about, he was imprisoned by Al-Hajjaj. And he was imprisoned by Al-Hajjaj until Al-Hajjaj passed away. And he passed away 14 years later. So Mujahid was basically a prisoner uh, uh, in uh, a prison in, uh, in Iraq by Al-Hajjaj for 14 years. Once Al-Hajjaj passed away, then basically Mujahid rahimahullah, was uh, released and he, he was, uh, 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 he was uh, given permission to basically go back to Mecca. So this was uh, Mujahid ibn Jabbar. Again, as we mentioned, there's not that much information with regards to uh, you know, his life 
from a chronological perspective, what happened when he was younger, what happened when he got older. Because you know, when we talk about these types of scholars, we take bits and pieces based on narrations that we hear from you know, other tabi'een, from companions and so on and so forth, about individuals. And this is how we piece information together. Nobody sits down and writes down the life of uh, Mujahid, uh, rahimahullah, or other scholars, because obviously it wasn't the way things were done in those days. So with regards to Mujahid, rahimahullah, and his character, the way Mujahid, rahimahullah, was, uh, narrations mention that he was someone who was very quiet. You know, he was someone who was very, very quiet. He would hardly speak to the extent that people would basically trivialize and talk about this amongst themselves. You know, one, he was known for this, basically. You know how sometimes today we talk about someone and we say, you know, the very quiet brother, he doesn't, hardly ever talks. You know, people mention that as a description to describe somebody. Likewise, people would describe uh, Mujahid, rahimahullah, in this manner. You know, they would talk about him being someone who was very, very quiet. He was known for his, for his silence. He wouldn't speak much. Al-A'mash, the commander that we mentioned, who revolted against Al-Hajjaj, he talks about Mujahid ibn Jabal, rahimahullah. And he says that when I would see uh, Mujahid, when I look at Mujahid, uh, he does, he's not someone who impresses me. You know, he's not someone who you look at and you think this person is going to be special. He's, he's someone who has that presence when you see him, or he has that authority, that aura about him. al Amash said, when you see him, you don't think much of him. He doesn't look like anyone special. In fact, he would look like someone who handles uh, baggage uh, uh, and puts them on a donkey, meaning just some average boat, maybe even lesser than a normal person uh, th that you might see on the street. And so he said, when you see him, you don't think much of him. You think he was someone who maybe used to you know, handle baggage and put them on donkeys. And you see him, he said, when you see him, you notice this about him. And also, you would think that he was someone who maybe had lost his donkey on top of this. So he was look, he was, he's looking for his donkey. Maybe he's you know, disheveled as well. He mentioned he was someone who was disheveled. He wasn't someone who would you know, dress in, in fine clothes, in nice clothes. Uh, and he was someone who was as if he had lost his donkey. He had like a worried sort of a demeanor about him, like a somber mood. The way, the way he would be, his character, his personality. You know, he was someone who wasn't jolly or smiling a lot. He was someone who was very somber. And it was like as if he had lost his donkey and he was worried about his donkey. So this is the way Laamash, rahimahullah, basically describes him. And then he continues and he says, but when he spoke, it was as if diamonds came out of his mouth. Meaning when he did speak, he spoke words which a person would think this man is... Is, is something else. Every time he would say something, every time he would speak, it was as if pearls were coming out of his mouth. Meaning he would, when he would speak, his words were valuable. They were so valuable, every time he would say something, there would be things which needed to be written in gold. And this was the way Mujahid rahimahullah was. He was someone who when you saw him, you wouldn't think much of him, but the moment he spoke, that's when you realize this man is unlike anybody else. You know, he... It was like as if pearls were coming out of his mouth. And again, this shows us the benefits of silence. You know, the more a person is silent, the less he speaks, the more he's thinking. And so the more a person thinks, the more he ponders about things, the more he, he, you know, he, he thinks about things himself, and the more he thinks about what he's going to say. And then when he says something, it's something which is given thought before he says it. You know, he, there's, there's a meaning behind what he's saying. He's not just saying whatever comes into his mind. He's thinking about it, and he's, you know, he's controlled. His, his, his speech is measured. He knows what he's going to say. It's deliberate. There's some benefit and wisdom and hikmah behind what he says. And so this shows us the importance and benefit of, of silence. The fact that when someone does speak, he only speaks when there's something important or, or valuable or beneficial to say. So again, we can see this from Mujahid rahimahullah. Also, it said about him that he would always pay attention to actions of the hereafter. He, what was always on his mind wasn't necessarily the dunya, but the akhirah. Thinking about the hereafter, about deeds that will benefit him, not in this life, but especially in the hereafter. Al-A'mash, the, the, the same individual, he said that I saw Mujahid in a somber mood. 
So one day I saw him and he was in a somber mood as if he was sad about something. And so I asked him why. I said, you know, he said, I asked him, well, what's wrong with you? Why are you, why are you looking like this? And so Mujahid, rahimahullah, he replied and he said, he said, one day, Abdullah ibn Umar, the famous Abdullah ibn Umar, he said, one day, Abdullah ibn Umar took hold of my hand because, of course, he's a tabi'i. And so, you know, his teachers are companions. This is what a tabi'i is. When we talk about a tabi'i, it's someone who studied under the companions. So he said that one day I was with Abdullah ibn Umar and he took hold of my hand and he said to me, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took hold of my hand and he said, kun fi dunya, be in this world as if you are a stranger or a traveler. And so he was thinking about this incident which took place. You know, this interaction that he had with Abdullah ibn Umar uh, radiallahu an. And also, he's thinking about the reality of this dunya. And so he put him in a somber mood. So again, he shows us he's always thinking about the akhirah. He realized this world is just something which is temporary. He's not going to be here forever. Also, it said that he was someone who was very careful about who he socialized with, who he mixed with. It said that, uh, he said in a famous statement, he said, no dead person dies except that when he does, no person dies except that when he does, the people who gather remembering him represent him and represent his life. I Meaning the people who come after your death, okay, and they meet and they gather, whether it's in the masjid, whether it's at, you know, at, 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 the, at the relative's uh, uh, place uh, or wherever they're going to gather to, 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 to uh, offer their condolences, they represent who you were while, while you were alive. And he said that if they are from people who remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that deceased person would have been from those who remembered Allah. I Meaning they represent him based on how he was when he was alive because they made the effort to come and attend his janazah prayer and offer condolences and so on and so forth. And he said that if they are people who followed their desires, then he would be from those individuals who basically followed their desires. So again, it shows us how he was very careful about who an individual socialized with because it has an effect on how you're viewed with other people and also with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how it has an effect on your behavior and on your actions as well. And the famous hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that man is on the religion of his friends, so look at who you become friends with, who you socialize with. Also, Mujahid rahimahullah, he said that if a person... Uh, didn't benefit you in this world in anything except that you were simply embarrassed to sin in front of him, then that's, that's good for him. That's enough. Meaning if you're with a person and he doesn't benefit you in any way except that you're afraid to commit sins in his presence, so you're embarrassed to commit sins in his presence, then that's enough. That's enough of benefit uh, from that specific individual because you're refraining and stopping from committing sins. Also, uh, he made a statement about, about knowledge and about those who Allah blesses with knowledge and the one who has fiqh, the one who has understanding. And he said that the faqih, the one who has understanding of the religion, the faqih, is the one who fears Allah no matter how little his knowledge is. And the one who is ignorant is the one who sins regardless of how much knowledge he has. So he's saying the faqih, the one who has understanding, is the one who actually fears Allah no matter how much knowledge he has, even if he has a small amount of knowledge. Why is that the case? Because when someone has a small amount of knowledge, but he fears Allah, he's going to treat that knowledge in the correct way. And he's going to use it in the correct manner. And he's going to act upon that knowledge. And it's an amana, it's a, tr it's a trust that he's been entrusted with by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he, teaches it, when he teaches it, he's going to teach it in the best possible way. And in the correct way. You know, and in the most authentic way. And he's not going to try to, uh, you know, uh, use it in a, in, a, in a bad way or in an incorrect way or in an insincere way. So he's saying the, the faqih, the true faqih is the one who fears Allah no matter how much knowledge he has. Even if it's a small amount of knowledge, there will be lots of khair, lots of good in that knowledge because of his fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said the ignorant one is the one who sins regardless of how much knowledge he has because that knowledge basically hasn't benefited him. 
Even if a person has uh, lots of knowledge, if he sins lots, if he's, if he's someone who sins repeatedly, then this person, uh, he's the one who is ignorant even though he has knowledge. Whereas we would think the one who has knowledge isn't really considered to be someone who is ignorant. Also, he mentioned in another statement, in another saying, he said that when the slave approves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his heart, when the slave approves of Allah in his heart, meaning what? He approves of Allah, what does that mean? Meaning he worships Allah, you know, and he worships Allah with sincerity, and he obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, stays away from those things which Allah has ordered him to stay away from, does those things which he's ordered him to do. When a person approves of Allah in his heart, Allah will approve of him through the hearts of the believers towards him. Meaning when a person approves of Allah, when a person obeys Allah, when a person is sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will respond in kind by having the believers approve of him in the dunya. They'll be happy with him. They'll praise him. They'll remember him in a good way. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will basically approve of that individual in this, li in, in this life. Also, Mujahid rahimahullah, he talked about uh, how... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he mentioned in a statement, he said, Verily Allah rectifies the son through the righteousness of his father. Meaning based on how you are, based on your character, based on your righteousness, based on your good deeds, this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will rectify the affairs of your children. So if you are someone who is righteous, and you're someone who worships Allah, and you're someone who's good, that as a result of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will rectify your children and also make them people who are righteous as well, as a result of you being righteous. And also, uh, he mentioned a tafsir of an ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, qalu rabbun Allah, thumma istaqamu, That verily those who say our Lord is Allah, and then they are steadfast in this, the angels will descend and they will say, Don't be afraid and don't be sad. So Mujahid rahimahullah, he interpreted this ayah and he said that this ayah basically means that the angels descend at the time of the death of the believer. And at this time the angels will say, Don't be afraid. Afraid about what specifically? Mujahid rahimahullah, he says, don't be afraid about what lays ahead. Don't be afraid about what's going to happen to you now, from now on ahead of you. Meaning in the grave, on the hereafter, and so on and so forth. And he says, don't worry, wala tahzanu. don't be sad, don't worry about what's left behind you. I mean, don't be worried and afraid about your family. Because you were steadfast in your deen. You know, you were someone who said, Rabbun Allah, my Lord is Allah, and you were steadfast in this. As a result of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will basically rectify the affairs of your children because of your sincerity, because of your righteousness. Also, Mujahid rahimahullah was someone who was well loved and respected amongst the people, even amongst the companions. So even the companions, and this shows us the status of Mujahid rahimahullah, even the companions showed respect to Mujahid rahimahullah. Uh, it said that Mujahid once said, I used to accompany Ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar, rahimahumallah. He said, I used to accompany Abdullah ibn Umar in travel, and when I wanted to mount an animal, he would basically hold the animal for me. So this is Abdullah ibn Umar, the famous companion of the Messenger of Allah. Sallam. He said he would hold the animal for me so that I could mount the animal. And he would straighten my clothes once I mounted the animal. Like as if he was serving Mujahid, Mujahid, even though he's the companion. Mujahid isn't the companion. And he said that uh, once uh, he saw me looking as if I disliked what he was doing. So when he, because he would do this repeatedly, once I made a face because I wasn't you know, comfortable with Abdullah ibn Umar doing this to me because he is who he is. He's a famous companion. And so he said that uh, I was uncomfortable, but I didn't like the fact that, you know, uh, he was doing this for me. And Abdullah ibn Umar, he recognized this. He recognized that, you know, I didn't look comfortable. And so he said, oh, Mujahid, uh, don't, be, don't be picky, don't be fussy about it. Don't make it a big deal, it's fine. You know, because you're someone who is, uh, you're someone who's respected, someone who's loved. 
I mean, don't worry about it. Don't feel uncomfortable uh, because of what I'm doing. And also he said about Abdullah ibn Umar, he said that I used to accompany him and I would want to serve him, but he would be the one who would serve me. And so again, this shows us the humility of uh, Abdullah ibn Umar as well. And again, this reflected onto Mujahid rahimahullah, because he was someone who was very quiet. He was someone who was, you would see him, he was disheveled. He wasn't someone who wore the best of clothes. And so people wouldn't give him two looks and two glances. They wouldn't think much of him because of the fact that uh, he would dress in this way. Also, what's interesting with regards to the things which Mujahid narrated is he mentioned once about Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, the famous companion of the Messenger of Allah He said that uh, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, uh, when he was buried, people would uncover the space above his grave and it would rain talking about the blessings of, Abdullah ibn, uh, of, 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 Abu, of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, the famous companion. So because, due to the, the, you know, the, the, the status of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, the famous companion, it would rain, showing the appreciation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regards to uh, this companion uh, of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa salam. Also, Mujahid rahimahullah, it said that he was someone who had white hair and he had a white beard. And he didn't like to dye the hair. And he disliked dyeing it black especially because of the famous hadith which uh, you know, forbade a person dis uh, dyeing their hair black. But he was someone who had white hair and he was someone who had uh, a white beard. So this is Mujahid rahimahullah. He lived uh, in Mecca and he traveled to other places but he predominantly lived in Mecca and he taught the people tafsir of the Quran and he was a scholar of the Quran, also a, a famous reciter of the, of the Quran. He passed away in Mecca and when he passed away, he was prostrating in prayer. So he passed away while he was performing sajda. So he was prostrating and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his soul while he was in this state and he passed away in the year, they say, between 101 and 104 hijrah. And he was around the age of 80 to 83 years old. So he was just over 83 years old. One of the famous scholars, he said that for me to hear from Mujahid's mouth is more beloved to me than my family and my wealth. For me to just hear the words of Mujahid is more beloved to me than my family and my wealth. And Mujahid, rahimahullah, it said that he once said, I, I have read the whole of the Quran to Ibn Abbas, which was his teacher, 30 times. Meaning I've recited the Quran. You know, and I've learned tajweed and the correct recitation of the Quran. And I've recited to him 30 times in order to perfect my recitation, to perfect my tajweed, to perfect my qira'a. You know, and this again shows us, uh, you know, how... Uh, focused he was and how important the Quran was to him and how sincere he was with regards to learning about the Quran. Also he said that, he said, I read the Quran to Ibn Abbas three times. At every single ayah I would ask him, who was it revealed regarding? And what was it revealed about? So he would ask about every single ayah. So three times he read to Ibn Abbas on top of the 30 times he already read previously. He would read three times from Fatiha to Surah Nas, after every single ayah, he would stop. And he would talk, ask about this ayah. You know, he would ask Ibn Abbas to explain this ayah. So again, it shows us his keenness with regards to learning the, the, the Quran and tafsir of the Quran especially. Also, uh, he would give tafsir of ayat and with regards to one of the ayat of the Quran uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Isa alayhi salam where Allah says, وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمُ لِلسَّاعَةِ that he is a portent of the hour. Mujahid rahimahullah, he said this proves that he is one of the signs of the day of judgment. So this is from the things which he said with regards to tafsir of the ayah. Also he was a scholar of fiqh. He wasn't just a scholar of tafsir and of the Quran. He was also a scholar of fiqh and he was someone who basically was one of those first scholars who started to uh, have views that basically formed usul al-fiqh, the principles of fiqh later on. So he was one of the pioneers of the, the principles of fiqh. Imam al-Dahibi rahimahullah, he said that the whole ummah is agreed upon the greatness of mujahid and using him as an evidence with regards to the Quran, with regards to uh, Islam. So basically talking about how uh, you know, strong mujahid was with regards to his knowledge. Also mujahid, 
uh, as we mentioned, he's one of the famous commentators of the Quran. And uh, Ibn, Ibn Jarid al-Tabari, the famous Mufassir who wrote his book, Tafsir al-Tabari, uh, he wrote uh, in his commentary and he included uh, more than 700 quotations from Mujahid himself. So more than 700 statements of Mujahid with regards to uh, his tafsir of specific ayat. So again, this shows us uh, how people were dependent on the tafsir of, of uh, Mujahid and the things he said with regards to uh, certain ayat uh, in the Quran. And finally, uh, he was also one of those individuals who referred to the tafsir of the Quran not just by tafsir of the Quran with the Quran and with the Sunnah, but also with things that he had heard from the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians, Israeliyat. And of course, this is something which is permitted. It's allowed for someone to narrate from the Israeliyat, but we don't use them as, uh, as evidence unless they agree with Islam itself. And so he was uh, one of those who basically contributed to the tafsir of the Quran by Israeliyat, by the narrations of the Jews and the Christians. So this, so this was uh, the life of Mujahid ibn Jabr, rahimahullah. He's someone who I've come across many times in books of tafsir. And sometimes you come across these names and you want to know more about them. Because sometimes all you see is the name. All you hear is the name. Mujahid said this, Mujahid said that, and you want to know more about them. So I felt like you know, it was maybe interesting to uh, you know, read a bit about him, about his life, about where he came from, who he was, things that he did, things we can learn from his life. And inshallah, I hope uh, we've benefited from, uh, from his life, inshallah. Uh, if there's any questions, then we'll take questions, inshallah. Okay, jazakumullah khair, subhanakallahumma bihamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha illa, anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilik.